One of the things that I do think is super interesting about this movie is that it's kind of a Rorschach inkblot test because you can see this movie as making fun of wokeness very easily, or you can see this movie as super woke. Okay. Obviously, massive spoilers for Barbie. Uh, the summary of the, of the plot is Barbie and Ken, Barb, there's like a, like thousands of Barbies and Kens, and they live in an alternate dimensional part of the world that's connected to our world card called Barbie Land. And in it, all the Barbies live as you would expect they live in, you know, Barbie Malibu dream houses and all this stuff. It's kind of like this fantastical uh, toy land experience. Um, but we find out that there's this weird thing where each Barbie... Okay, before I explain this, the plot of this movie, or let me say not, not the plot, the rules of this universe make absolutely no sense. And you just have to accept it. The amount of plot holes in this, the rules of this universe are astronomical. It's kind of like in the... Um, what was the movie where like the people were living underground and you had like the doubles of yourselves? Oh, yeah, that movie. Uh, what was it, Them? Yeah, that movie was ridiculous. Yeah. It, what was the name of that movie? I can't remember. The Get, the get Out important. guy made it. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's kind of like it's kind of like that movie where the rules of the universe... Us was the name of the movie. The rules of the universe don't make any sense if you think about it for two seconds. The rules of the Barbie universe make no sense. They make more we, sense than us. But. No, they don't. They make no sense because... The the plot, the premise is, is that all these Barbies, even though they live in this other universe, each Barbie is supposed to be associated with a human who's playing, who's played or plays with it. And that whatever that human does to that Barbie or thinks about that Barbie influences that Barbie's behavior in Barbie land. And the reason it doesn't make any sense is because, number one, there should literally be millions of Barbies if that's the case. Like way more Barbies. There should be way more duplicates of Barbies, right? And most of the Barbies should be destroyed. They should have their limbs cut off. They should be chopped in little pieces. They should all be in trash cans. Because I'd imagine that most Barbies in the unit in the world have all been thrown away at some point. Right? Those will all be in Barbie two. Yeah. Where we visit the landfill <laughs> okay. of all the right. discarded Barbies. Right. But let's just right. let's just do the plot summary okay, first okay. before so, we right. give I'm our just take letting on. you know that you have to like put the rules of this out of your mind. Okay. So the rules are each Barbie associated with a human, that human's interaction with the Barbie affects the Barbie and Barbie land. So our main Barbie, who's literally called stereotypical Barbie, uh, Margaret Robbie's character. Right. But she, they have a lot of different, they obviously have like a black Barbie and a Latina Barbie and all yes. that stuff. Because and they're all called Barbie. In the real world, we do have all those Barbies now. So this actually maps onto yes. the the Barbie yes. real world correctly. Although Though my I, wife claims that she's never seen a fat Barbie in her life, and there is a fat Barbie in the movie. There's so. a fat Barbie prominently in the movie in many, right. many, 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 many scenes that they want to put out there to say, listen, right. we're not you know, shaming fat women. Well, I, the fact that they don't have a line of fat Barbies is telling. So all, of the, they, all of the other Barbies, including the wheelchair Barbie, exists as a toy. Yes. Fat Barbie does not exist as a toy. So you, well, you take that how you Okay, so the, so the Fat Barbie doesn't actually exist. That was a lie. Right. Interesting. Well, I well here's this. I thought the other Barbies, like all like the Black Barbies and the Hispanic Barbies, I don't think they're called Barbie. I thought they all had different names. Well, I, th I think they're called Barbie. Okay. Well, anyway, everyone's Barbie. Everyone's Ken in the universe, except there's one Alan. Right. There's a couple other known ones. But anyway, it's not but, important. And the Alan thing is never explained, which kind of sucks, but continue. It is never explained. Um, okay, so our main Barbie, uh, she's kind of going through her dream day, and uh, we find out that she's having random thoughts of death right. that she's never had in her entire life. Then all of a sudden, her feet, as you see in the trailer, her feet become flat because normally she walks around in high heels, and her feet like maintain the high heel shape as if she was a doll. Um, and then she starts getting cellulite. And so she goes to see... Uh, Kristen Wiig, who's called Weird Barbie, because she's supposed to be the representation of the one Barbie that the kid played too hard with and broke its legs and cut its hair and put crazy makeup on its face and blah, 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 blah. 
Not and, Kristen Wiig, but I can't remember the I name. Mean, I mean, not actress. Kristen Wiig. Um, yeah. The, yeah other, the, the other Kristen Wiig. <laughs> the other Kristen Wiig, yeah. The lady from Ghostbusters. Right. Um, 2017. That's okay. I'll look it up. You continue. Um, no, it is Kristen Wiig. What are you talking about? That is not Kristen Wiig, but... Kristen Wiig is in Ghostbusters, but... Oh, then who am I thinking? Who's the lady in Barbie? I will look it up. Continue with Okay, your... anyway. So... Um, so... And, and this whole time this is going on, we learn that Ken exists, who is Ryan Gosling's character, and Ken is hopelessly in love with Barbie, um, and it seems like he's been created expressly to be in love with Barbie, and she does not feel the same way about him. Even though she describes them as boyfriend and girlfriend at a point in the movie, she doesn't seem to have any feelings for him, really, except to like kind of pat him on the head. Kind of like a little brother that you don't really want to hang around with. <laughs> Kate McKinnon is the actress. Kate McKinnon, thank you. Yes. Who was also in Ghostbusters. True. Yeah, yeah. that's why. Okay. Um, so anyway, so Barbie's having these like weird problems. Kate McKinnon's character tells her, because she's been broken, she somehow, the fact that she's like ugly and broken and weird has granted her some kind of knowledge of the outside world. And she says, okay, she explains to Barbie the rules that this means that her owner is having a, a, t a tough time so that she has to go venture into the real world to go fix her owner's problems so that she can fix her own problems in Barbie land. So Barbie goes out into the real world. Ken tags along, as you see in the trailer, uh, and they go on this journey to find the owner. Uh, meanwhile, we find out that, oh, this is where it gets weird. So they, when they enter the real world, it's supposed to be the year 2023. But it's as it's as if it's 1970 and what i mean by that is that the level of overt sexism is on the level of like 1960 mad men it's actually worse it's actually more sexist than 1960s mad men everyone in the real world is so overtly sexist it's baffling okay yes like they they when they enter the real world they're on venice beach okay they're in california they're in the wokest of woke places besides portland oregon and she is skating next to Ryan Gosling, her gigantic boyfriend, and they and all these people are like like making these like sexually suggestive comments to her, which I don't think would ever happen in the real world. Not and, in a million years. Not yeah, in Venice not in Beach. You, you'd be arrested. And then someone has the audacity to run up and slap her her butt. She's standing next to Ryan Gosling, who's like this mountain of a man in this movie. Okay. And it's like, I'm supposed to believe that even if someone is so sexist that they think they can just run up and smack her butt, they're going to do it next to who's obviously her boyfriend wearing this matching uniform who's like gigantic. Okay. But it happens. And then she reactively punches him in the face. And then somehow she gets arrested for that. Right. And while she's being arrested, the police are making sexist comments to her about her outfit. Okay? Yes. So... This and is we'll a, come back. by the way, this is a comedy guy. So they're doing this for for comedic reasons. But it's this it's, isn't a drama. <laughs> it's straining, and we'll come back to those. Look, this is to this, this is like saying this is like, you're evaluating it like it's not a Step Brothers type movie. Like, look, you could evaluate Step Brothers as if it's a drama. Is Step but Brothers? But it's not. Look, okay, let me as soon question. as you as soon as you drift into the Catalina wine mixer, right? You're like you're going. Look, there's no way the Catalina wine mixer would happen in the real world. Yeah, of course it wouldn't. It's a comedy. Sitch. Okay, so in a comedy movie like Step Brothers or Zoolander, or um, yes, it's any, like any the tone any of movie, this okay. movie is very right. much like Zoolander. But, wait, but here's okay? the problem: Zoolander is a funny movie. A Dodgeball is a funny movie. That when you have wacky characters doing wacky things, they're not trying to make statements about reality. Bar Barbie is a com is a comedy. Wait, but you understand that, like in in the movie Dodgeball or Zoolander, like you like yes, it's it's completely insane that there would be realistically be a Derek Zoolander character who's that stupid, and all the models would be that stupid, right? Like it's a hyper. Will you know, Ferrell is in this like, movie. Wait, 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 <laughs> pa wait, stop. Let me finish. Okay. In the movie Zoolander, we have these comedy characters that are so stupid that it's a joke. 
right? All the male models are yes. stupid. Uh, that's a, that is the joke. It's not making a statement. It's not making an actual statement about male models or reality or the universe or society. It's, it's not just making done a statement that male models are stupid. I believe no. it is. I don't think Zoolander is trying to make a statement about the actual stupid levels of male models. The I, male I models think would be is. so stupid, they would have a gasoline fight and then light themselves on fire and blow up. Okay? I, think I don't that think is that's the message of Zoolander. That's explicitly the statement that Zoolander is trying no, that's to make. The, that's that the male joke. models are no, idiots. You're wrong. You're, but no, you're wrong. Zoolander is playing off of the stereotype as a joke that attractive people are extra stupid. Right. That's the joke. It's playing off of it. It's not, it's not saying it's true. It's just using it like the hyper... The hyper, uh, and that's not, like that's so not what's going on. Trend. That's not what's going on in Barbie. That they're playing off the stereotype that cops are sexist pigs. No, everyone in this universe, in the real universe, is like in hyper sexist. And the problem with saying that's a comedy is because that's the point of the movie, is this element of sexism. But anyway, let's we'll come back to this. Okay, let me just get through the plot analysis, or let me just explain the plot. Okay, so she's in the real world. Everyone's super sexist. Will Ferrell is the CEO of Mattel. He finds out about this. They're trying to re-bring Barbie back to the Barbie world because apparently there's some big problem. If Barbie exists in the real world, it's a big problem. It's never explained what will happen. What, well, like, they, they do the allude to... is never explained. They do allude to something else had happened in the future that turned out to be a big nightmare, but it is No, kind in, the, in of, the past they say that there was another... Barbie's sister came... And she attempted to do something dangerous with her owner. Like, that was the only thing. But he makes it seem like there's some kind of existential threat, like reality will be destroyed or something. But they never really explain what the threat is, besides that Barbie just doesn't know what to do in the real world and because Barbie's from a fictional, or from a fantasy land. Okay. Well, they do allude to a threat, but it actually goes against the movie being woke because the the threat that's taking place is that you know once ken goes back and takes over barbie world all of a sudden it, it's causing there to be a lot more misogyny in the real world because you know they're selling a bunch more ken like misogyny ken dolls ken dolls, right. okay. which that, completely yeah. goes okay. against the idea that the movie is woke because well it doesn't but we'll get into that okay mm -hmm. so then okay so barbie's looking for her owner Barbie th Barbie is like using her psychic connection to the owner and she has images of a daughter and a mother playing with a Barbie. She assumes that it's the daughter. She goes and finds the daughter and the daughter is a horrible person. They are a horrible person that uses wokeness to bully Barbie for no reason. <laughs> this is, you've probably seen this clip of the scene where she calls Barbie a fascist and all these other horrible things and makes Barbie cry. Okay, so this, this little girl is just awful. Well, this, this is all going this, on. This scene is okay. I well, well, hold on, I read this hold on. scene as hilarious. So okay, it's it's fine, but let me just get through the plot. Okay, while this is all going on, Ken uh, goes off and he discovers the patriarchy. Okay, he's just wandering around, and it's actually very interesting. The thing that first gets him like interested in the world is that a woman comes up to him and asks him what time it is, and just that little thing that she respects him enough to, to stop and say, excuse me, do you know what time it is? He's suddenly like, oh my God, I'm thought of as like a person. Someone literally asked me a question. They regard my opinion in some minor way. Like this is how pathetic his life is in the Barbie world. Someone literally asking what time it is, is like enough to give him like he's an oppressed. existential, like he is, he's super oppressed. It's enough to like make him feel like he has worth just being asked the time. Okay. And so then he's like walking around. He notices that people are like, oh, excuse me. Or like, like people like hold the door open for him. And he's like, this is the most amazing thing I've ever experienced in my entire life. And then in this completely insanely ridiculous uh, scene, he goes up and he like enters a random building downtown. First of all, it's hilarious that like downtown and the school are like somehow within walking distance of each other. But okay. Uh, he goes in this building downtown and he goes up an escalator. And for some reason, wherever building he's in, it's like these all these TV monitors. And it's just a montage of like male presidents horses money with men's face on it. it's like this weird montage of just like men doing things you're like what the heck building is this and seeing this montage like in parts and and ken like like the wisdom of the patriarchy or something well no he goes he goes to <laughs> no, the and library then he comes back to, yeah then he comes back to the school and then he goes into the library and he finds all the books on the patriarchy that he can and he right reads them right so he reads up on right. the patriarchy yes and then he he assumes because he's reading all this feminist feminist literature that he can just you know, live life on easy mode. 
Yes. So, and he goes to get a bunch of jobs. Like He tries to get a bunch right. of jobs. Yeah. So he tries to be a doctor, I think. Yes. So there are all these different things that he tries, but he fails miserably. That's important. Yes. Go ahead. There's a, continue. Yes. There's, a, there's an important scene where he goes, uh, he tries to get two jobs. He goes to an office building and he tries to get a job there. And the guy, he's talking to a guy. And the mm -hmm. guy says, well, do you have an M, you know, do you have a degree? Do you have some kind of degree? A lot he of says, PhDs no. here. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a PhD or, or whatever? And he, and Ken's like, no, but I am a man. And the guy's like, well, I can't hire you for that. And he's like, yeah, but I thought this was a patriarchy. And the guy this is a line in the movie. The guy says, well, it still is a patriarchy, but we're better at hiding it. Well, and Ken says, well, he, oh, he okay. but the guy also says, yeah, when he says, I'm a man, he says, well, that's kind of a disadvantage at this point. Yes, that's true. That's a good point. He does. Yeah. That, right? So, I mean, that scene so could play either way. Yeah, exactly. Right, but so that's why it's conflicting. It's very strange. Okay. So he says both. Then, then he tries to get a job as a doctor and he talks to a female doctor and she's like, you need to just get out of here. And he's like trying to ignore her because he's like, "Where are all the men doctors?" And then, right. um, then he tries to get a job as a lifeguard. Um, yes, actually, yeah. What, that was that was funny. One of the funny recurring jokes in it is that Ken's job as a Barbie is his beach. He's beach, right? He's Beach Ken. And you go, what does that mean? He's not a lifeguard. It's just he's Beach Ken. He's just supposed to exist on a beach. That's his job in the Barbie world. Yes, <laughs> he just exists in the vicinity of a beach. Which I thought was very, that was funny. There were some funny bits in the movie. So anyway, so uh, Barbie's devastated after having the conversation with a little girl. Um, she ends up getting kidnapped by Mattel. She goes to the Mattel office. They try to put her literally back into a Barbie box to take her back to Barbie land. What? She decides to, to run away. This, um, this, it doesn't Ken go back first? Because I think that's important too. So Ken, Ken experiences this, uh, he, he can't achieve anything in the world. Like, he experiences a meritocracy even though he's read all these books on patriarchy. So he decides, I'm going to go back to the Barbie world. So he leaves. Yeah, once Barbie gets kidnapped, he ditches her and leaves and goes back to the Barbie world alone. Right, yes. With his um, newfound knowledge of patriarchy. Of patriarchy, right. Right. And he, they actually say patriarchy. Like, we're not... They do, yeah. He says patriarchy like a million times in this movie, okay? Yeah, he, he, is, he says, I'm going to go back and establish a patriarchy. Yeah, that is, literally says that, okay? Um, so then, okay, so while he's establishing his patriarchy, uh, Barbie is running around in the Mattel offices trying to escape. And it's kind of doesn't... It kind of ruins part of it because... Up until this point, the real world has been more like, quote, realistic. And Barbie right. world has been like fantasy. And for some reason, the Mattel office, like everyone is like so goofy and silly that it's like doesn't make it like it's not the real world anymore. It's like this bizarre hyper fantasy realm. This is why I brought up the Catalina wine mixer, because we're definitely in Catalina wine mixer territory here. But it doesn't it. That part of the movie is very bizarre because. Up until this point, they had been made this clear delineation between the Barbie world and the real world, and now it's like mixed together in the Mattel office for no reason, and not in a have not funny way either. Well, I, like, I mean, I would argue that the cop station was the same, but you're saying that that so somehow drama. Okay, so the cop station, the the cops are just being very overtly sexist to Barbie. Okay, talking about they're like talking about how hot she is and what she's wearing. Yes. At the Mattel factory, there's literally a scene where she's running away from the CEO and all the, the people on the board. And they're running through cubicles, and all the CEOs are just running in random directions around each other. None of them are actually ch chasing Barbie. They're just running in random directions in a very silly, over-exaggerated manner as she's trying to weave in and, and around them. Like, they're all like like robots and video game characters. We don't have to make a big deal of this. but I'm just I saying it's weird because, like, that's so detached from the rest of the real world. Look, I think that the tonality of the real world is is the same as the Mattel I factory. You're just not. completely disagree. With I know me. you disagree, but yeah. we can move on. Okay. So, so anyway, so eventually, um, Barbie meets the ghost in the Mattel place. He doesn't realize at the time she meets the ghost of the first person who created Barbie, named Ruth. Um, she escapes the Mattel place, and she ends up meeting. Um, she finds out that that it, the daughter wasn't the person that owned her. It was the daughter's mom was the owner of the Barbie. Correct. And conveniently, the mom is also the secretary of the CEO of the Barbie factory. Very conveniently. Very conveniently. <laughs> Which I hate, uh, obviously. Right. But whatever. So 
So the mom recognizes, oh, the mom had overheard a conversation early in the movie about how Barbie escaped. So the mom realizes that this is a real Barbie um, and and kind of like says, oh, come with us, come with us. And they kind of drive away and they go on like this uh, car chase. And while Barbie's in the car with them, she realizes that that's her Barbie that she has. And that the reason Barbie has had all these thoughts is because she's had all these thoughts. She's had thoughts about death. She's had thoughts about cellulite. She's had all these thoughts. And she's the one that's been influencing Barbie to feel all these kind of negative uh, human emotions. So then so then they decide, the mother, the daughter, and Barbie decide to all go back to Barbie land. And when they get there, they find out that Ken has got there first and he's reestablished, or I guess he shouldn't reestablish, he has created his patriarchy um, dream Mm-hmm. Where all the men are now in charge, all the women walk around in maid outfits and serve them beers all the time. Um, and so, like, even like, so before this, in the Barbie universe, it was the opposite. All the men were subservient, and no man had any position of power whatsoever. They were basically the Stepford husbands. And so, like, the president was a woman, everyone in the Supreme Court was a woman, every position of power was a woman. And now it's the reverse. It's all just men, all the women, including the president, including the doctors, including the Supreme Court justices. They've all been regulated to to wearing sexy maid outfits and serving beer to their Kents. Okay, (laughs) it's so hilarious. Yes. So then, so then uh, Barbie talks to Ken, and and Ken, you know, they have an argument, and essentially Barbie gives up. She says, "I can't fix this." I don't know how to fix this. And she lays down on the floor face down in the grass, <laughs> which is a funny scene. Cause she's like, the, she's physically moving like a doll and it's very funny, um, but she just gives up. Um, and then the daughter and the mom decide to leave. And then the, the daughter decides kind of for no reason um, to start to bond with her mother and then to come back and that they should go back and save the Barbies. Right. And so they do, they do go back and they hook up with the other, the non Ken male who's named Alan, which is not super important, but they hook up with him and he basically brings them to Weird Barbie. And when they're talking to Weird Barbie, there's like this really insipid scene where the mother, the mom character, the mom who's the mother who's the Barbie is her Barbie, gives this long diatribe about the woes and perils of being a woman right in in a in, man's world in 2023 right? yes in it's 2023. very it's the kind of speech you'd hear out of aoc and think yes. oh that's not real <laughs> right you know the whole like oh my god we're expected to be strong but not too strong because if we're too strong we'll be called like bitchy and we're expected to you know to to like turn men down but we can't turn them down too hard because we don't want to hurt their feelings like you know you've heard all this it is it is laying it on thick yes it's the yeah it's the most thick lay on you know feminist crap we've all heard which by the way people have i don't fault a woman for saying that she experiences that my problem is the way the movie frames it it's like women are the only people that experience these conflicts while men don't experience any conflicts in society and that's kind of the problem with this but anyway so she goes. She gives us like long. It's like literally like a three minute long speech, but the woes of being a woman in twenty twenty three, and this speech is so powerful that it wakes up the brainwashed Barbies. Right. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's another thing that I, I forgot to point out. When Ken takes over this universe and he subjugates all the Barbies, for some reason, all the Barbies just accept their new roles as being subservient to the male Kens, and they're all very happy about it. They're totally happy about it. And the explanation the movie gives is, is, well, it's like when smallpox infected the Native Americans, they didn't have any immunity to the patriarchy because they've never experienced it. So all the women just happily go along with being, you know, second class citizens, essentially, until they hear the mother's speech about how much it sucks to be a woman. And then they're pissed. And then they wake up from the the brainwashing, which, by the way, makes no sense because none of the Barbies have experienced any of these things that the mom is talking about because they've lived in Barbie land their whole lives. Yeah, that's and never had a to total contradiction. Right. But the but the symbolism is supposed to be like when you talk about the symbolism is supposed to be speaking truth to power. Like simply her speaking her experience from a standpoint epistemological uh, perspective is so powerful it wakes people up 
from the conditioning of the patriarchy. Like that's the symbolism here. So they concoct this plan where they're going to go around and, and one by one take all the Barbies by force, kidnap them, and have the mom give their feminist speech to them. And that's going to br- wake them up from the brainwashing. Which okay. works, surprisingly. And this works. Right? Yes. But here's an important thing. None of this, Barbie isn't doing really any of this. She's just tagged along essentially for this whole thing. Yeah, this right? is a this is a big problem. They switch yeah. protagonists midstream here. All of a sudden, America Ferreira is the protagonist. Yeah, the mother is the the one that's enacting the change and doing all the work here. Right. Um, and so there's this stupid plot point where essentially the men have to, they, they haven't just taken over by force. They've like tricked all the women into being subservient and they're going to have a vote where they're going to vote in the Barbie constitution to make it so that men are in charge and women are the second class citizens. And in order to stop men for, from participating in the vote, the Barbies have concocted a plan to make it so that all the men will be too busy fighting each other than actually going to vote that day. So that the Barbies alone can vote and they could keep subjugating the males. Right. And the way that election they do this, interference. Right. <laughs> and the way that they do this is pretty gross. It is terrible. Um, so the big plan is is that all the Barbies are gonna go to all their kens who are like built to love them, and they're going to pretend that they're in love with their Ken for like the first time actually make their Ken feel happy okay and then when they're on a date with their Ken in the middle of the date they're going to pretend like they've lost interest in their Ken and they're going to start hanging out with a different Ken to make them jealous right okay. they're going to pull the same thing that Jonah Hill's girlfriend pulled on him <laughs> yes intentionally literally they're going to intentionally break the Ken's hearts this way that the Kens will fight each other, all right? Yes, they're going to turn the Kens into jealous monsters who hate right. one another. Right. Though, of course, when this scene, it, the logic of the scene doesn't even make sense because the way it's shot is like Ken is on a date with Barbie, Ryan Gosling's on a date with Barbie, and he's singing to her. Um, they're all singing the song, uh, I Want to Push You Around, which we'll talk about. There's a lot of symbolic implications there. And he's singing the song to Barbie on guitar. And you see this like 20 other Kens singing the exact same song to Barbie on the guitar all at the beach in a circle. And the thing that doesn't make any sense is that the Barbies all get up and they all switch Kens. But there's 20 of them. So they should all just be switching. So they should all end up still with another Barbie. There shouldn't be any Kens left out. And yet at the end of it, somehow half the Kens have no Barbies with no explanation. Right. How does that work? Plot hole. Okay. Big plot hole. But anyway, so this this works. The the Kens get all jealous with each other and they engage in some sort of war, which is really a the dance music, off at the beach. The dance off. The I'm just Ken, which is the best song in the movie. It is hilarious. It it's is so song. funny. It is That's so the funny, I'm just yeah. Ken part. Yeah. Um and then while they're busy fighting, the Barbies go and they vote and they vote themselves back into power. Um and then they basically say at the end of it, listen, Ken. We'll give you... Oh, okay. So there's a scene where the Kens say, oh, well, we realize that we were wrong to try to subjugate you. Um, but can we have a little bit of power? Can we have some Kens on the Supreme Court? And the president, the female president of Barbie literally says, no, maybe we'll give you some lesser circuit courts, but we're not going to give you, we're not going to give you equal representation. You're going to have to work for that for like 60, 70 years. Right. Okay. Which is supposed to be mirroring how like the real you know, world in, is in the yeah. real world you know we didn't snap our fingers and create equal equal representation but of course it comes off really gross in this movie because it's literally like we're subjugating you you subjugated us maybe they should be equal at the end of it no we're just going back to subjugating you and we'll give you a tiny tiny sliver of the pie now <laughs> which is really gross like message of the movie that you're you know trying to teach children this um so that's how that resolves for all the kens for the main ken it resolves where basically Barbie says, I don't love you. I'll never love you. You need to go find who you are on your own. And he finally just says, okay, I'll find myself on my own. And then for no reason, Barbie, well, we don't really understand her motivation at this point, decides to leave the Barbie world and go back to the real world with the mother and the daughter. And she does. And then that's the end of the movie. Well, I mean... She goes back to the real world, but she becomes a real woman. She becomes a real human. And they show this at the end 
by her going to a gynecology appointment. Yes. They make several jokes throughout the movie about how no one has any genitals. Yeah. So in the very end, she's walking into an office. You assume this is like her interview for the high-powered woman job. And no, it's just an appointment, her first appointment with a gynecologist. Yes. Which I do think could easily be read as a thumb in the eye of of uh trans people but it could no it could be it, i don't think that was intentional um right okay okay so that's kind of your gist of the movie okay so let's talk about let's actually try to analyze analyze this uh piece of crap <laughs> okay so well you th think be clear on why you're calling it a piece of crap because i okay. like i i have tons of problems with the movie in that right. You know, we're playing protagonist bingo here. It's like, yeah. I don't feel like there's a real protagonist. I don't feel like the ending is very satisfying because you don't have a main protagonist motivated to achieve something that is ultimately achieved or not achieved in the end. And, and you know, it's a it's a bitter ending where the, they miss their goal or they achieve their goal and it's an uplifting ending. The she like her goal is never really to become a real woman so at the end of the movie right. when she becomes a real woman i'm like well Why? who cares yeah exactly okay so, well, let's, let's but let's but this is all a s politics aside this is like right. m you know movie stuff like right. what makes a satisfying movie well, let's break into two things we're gonna there's a political angle and then there's just the strict film angle okay sure so why don't we just talk about the strict film angle first before we get into the politics of it okay, okay. So from the strict film perspective, the movie is very shallow in terms of this is what this is what I tweeted. The movie is very shallow. It's too long in, in places it doesn't need to be and way too short in other places. So the the setup for the movie is really good. Okay. Barbie lives in this like weird fantasy world. Um, there's a problem that besets her ordered world that sets it into chaos, and she, the hero, has to go off and bring order back to her her home right classic right. story opening okay the problem is as soon as she goes off into the real world that's like completely lost sight of um because as you said like her motivation in the beginning of the movie is just to fix her place in her world yeah fix utopia right which number one she doesn't do because she goes into the real world she gets sad she then gets rescued by her owner and then they get she gets brought back to the Barbie world. So first of all, she's not really controlling her actions at this point. No, she doesn't go and Weak find protagonist. her protagonist. Right, right. Her the mom is saving her. The mom is the one that's kind of like leading the actions. And then when they get back to the Barbie world, and everything's like worse, so more chaos has come to her home world. Barbie, our hero, doesn't fix anything. She gives up. Right. She gives up, and then she's not even the one that that like concocts the plan to save the other barbies it's the mother yep that has the speech that will save all the other barbies so we've switched protagonists midstream right. here and you're going look i have no emotional investment in this mom character that just popped into the movie halfway through so yes. from a filmmaking standpoint it's really just lame yeah i mean and they could have done something interesting you know barbie obviously coming into the real world you have an opportunity to do the legally blonde type thing where she has to really struggle to be able to find the person that's doing this and we find out you know maybe she is smarter than than she's made out to be and we kind of fall right. in love with the character along the way exactly. but no she just sits down on a park bench and imagines it and it comes to her without any effort at all you're like oh okay well fuck me right yes exactly yeah she so doesn't Structure as a movie, it's just terrible. Yeah, she as a, as a protagonist, Barbie is incredibly shallow, hollow. She's literally the Hollow Knight from Hollow Knight. She's an empty vessel. Now, here's what's kind of interesting because I think this was intentional. I realized this when I was watching the scene where the mother is like going on her tirade about how hard it is to be a woman. Oh, that scene I think, is so bad, and it's so it, long. I imagined America Ferrera practicing the scene in her trailer before it actually <laughs> happened. Right. It's, and it's funny because Barbie's like laying on the floor when she does the speech. And I'm trying to remember in my mind, I think there's literally a shot where it's like a, you're, the camera's looking, the camera's like on the floor looking up at her. And so she's kind of like talking down to you as she's giving the speech. <laughs> like she's literally talking down to you as she's giving the speech. Yes. Yeah. Um, no. So um, 
I, this is what I think is kind of interesting. I think the thought process here was that Barbie as a character is supposed to be like the Barbie doll in the real world in that it is a blank slate for whatever girl is watching the movie to project her thoughts and feelings onto this character. She's a vessel for you to project whatever you want onto her. Right. And I think they tried to do that with her character in the movie, which is stupid because a movie doesn't work that way. Right. And so you basically have a, a completely feckless protagonist who goes on a journey, doesn't figure out anything on the journey, doesn't gets back home, doesn't solve the problem that has now beset her home. So then at the end of the movie, she didn't she didn't do anything. When the end of the movie, when everyone's like standing around like, you saved us, Barbie, I'm like, she didn't do anything. She right. did nothing to save anyone. It was all other Barbies, it was all the mom that saved everyone. So then at the end of the movie, when she's like, I want to go be a real person, you're like, why? Yeah, we didn't learn anything to figure out the motivation there, which is part of the reason why you're calling it shallow, and I completely agree with you. Yes. And then when you even look at the, the mom character, so you have this mother-daughter character, which is kind of like the central emotional point of the movie, which is very interesting when we get into the politics of this. Um, like, the, the main conflict between the mother and the daughter is that the daughter is a typical teenager who's an asshole to their mother, right? Right. Uh, the, the, the daughter is just, is woke and is using wokeness as a weapon to bully people. And for no reason, really, the daughter starts to not be such a bitch to her mom and they connect. Yeah, but we have no, we don't understand the motivation there. There's no inciting incident for that. Yes. It's just kind of random. Yeah. It's just, just completely random. And it's weird because they could have done it very easily where when the mom is in the Barbie world and she's giving her feminist speech and fixing all the other Barbies, her daughter could have seen that. And been like, oh, my mom's cool. Look at this. She's like saving all these you other Barbies. You cannot look at that speech and think your mom is cool. Well, the daughter would because the daughter was hyper woke. Right. But they kind of took that away from her. I, I thought, man, the daughter's character was super interesting in the beginning when she, tell, call, she basically calls Barbie a fascist <laughs> and says, you know, she's supporting the capitalist patriarchy. Which yeah. is an interesting choice because, you know, seeing a more conservative mom who grew up playing with Barbies and, you know, obviously has some sort of affection for, for Barbie in that sense, conflicting with a daughter who is just completely, you know, anti-capitalist, anti-establishment would be an interesting conflict to explore. But they just immediately drop it. They don't explore it yeah. at all. It's it's completely all of a sudden right. they're all, on the same team if she would have went back to barbie world and maintained that attitude that would have added 10 times more conflict in barbie world and could have been so much more interesting yeah, yeah. well and also and maybe they could have done a thing where like because the, the daughter is wrong well maybe you could call the Barbie world fascist <laughs> but it she was wrong because when barbie in barbie's land before ken takes over it's the it's not a patriarchy it's the hyper matriarchy yeah but imagine if she discovered that the matriarchy was also fascist but in the same way and then had a realization yes that would have been interesting that would have been interesting yes yes yeah. exactly she would exactly. have been like oh my god they're oppressing men here the same way we oppress women in my world right yeah okay so we have barbie's character doesn't really go anywhere it makes sense you have the mother-daughter dynamic that is just shallow and flips for no reason without really exploring anything interesting about it. And then we have Ken, who's the other main character. Who has the most tangible goal in the whole thing. Yes. How much do you yes. love a character that has a tangible goal, Sitch? Well, that's what, you know, it's funny. I'm watching this movie and I'm like, Adam's going to love Ken. The same reason he loved Bowser. Of course. <laughs> you have, you have the male character who has a very clear goal. He wants Barbie to love him. Yes. Okay? Yes. Very clear. And she doesn't, right? So it's like, okay. We, and it's so funny because we were talking about this on Sunday. You have the the, the unrequited love uh, yes. character, right? That you know most people can empathize with and understand very instantaneously and you know feel bad for. We have all felt that. It's very easy to empathize yes. with. Yes. And everything he does, including taking over Barbie land, it's all motivated by the fact that Barbie doesn't love him. Yes. Everything he does is motivated by this. And him trying to essentially win 
her affection over and failing to do so. Now he establishes a literally establishes a patriarchy to win a woman. What does that yes. tell you? What does it tell you? Right? Yes, there's some yes. deeper, some much deeper there things is. going on here. There yeah. is. But then at the end of it, when the Barbies take everything back, so the resolution of this is Ken runs up to the bed and cries. <laughs> And she like taps his head and says, there, there, little baby, everything will be fine. And he literally says, you know, ruling things was hard anyway. I don't really want to do it anymore. <laughs> Which is funny because it's literally like the stereotype of the woman, right? Of oh, course. ruling is hard. Don't worry your pretty little head. You don't want to. It's just too much work. Right. So they give this to Ken. This is the end of the movie, by the way. They give Ken this like stereotypical female, like, you know, negative stereotype of a female. Ruling is too hard. And it just is like. Barbie just says, you need to go be your own person. And he just accepts it for no reason, even though the implication is that Ken, as a as an entity, has been literally designed by the god of this universe to be her love interest. And he's just supposed to just go off and accept being himself. And he does for no reason. Yeah, Ken gets totally screwed in this movie. Well, no, he accepts it. He just says, okay. He's like, okay, you're right. I'm going to be my own man. But I was like, why? What? what made him change? What made him realize that change? Nothing. She Nothing. just gives a speech, like a, a two-minute speech, and he changes his mind. Okay, so none of the characters' arcs make any sense. The rules of the universe don't make any sense. And I already talked about the rules of how the Barbies work doesn't make really any sense whatsoever. The rules of applying to the Kens don't make any sense either, because the implication is Ken was created to be in love with Barbie. Why are the Barbies not in love with their Kens? Because the... Well, obviously, I can think of a reason that is not in the movie, which is obviously bad story writing. So yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Like the rules, like why in the rules of the universe? Why do the Barbies I can head like candidate them? for you if you want me to. No, but but I'm saying. But then it, it gets even less makes even less sense because there's a central plot point where Ryan Gosling Ken is jealous of this other guy who I don't know who's the actor's name is an Asian Ken, and they're both fighting for Margot Robbie's affections. Yes. Which doesn't make any sense because I thought this beach can was made for her, number one. Number two, there should be like four to five times as many Barbies than there are Kens. There's way more Barbie dolls than there are Ken dolls. So the Ken should be swimming in Barbies. There should be no conflict for women in this movie <laughs> at all. Right. Like the number, like the disparity between the men and the women should be way in the woman's favor. So why, why are there multiple Kens fighting over the same Barbie? That doesn't even make sense. Yeah, they and they never really go into the logic of the world like that. No, they don't. But this is these are like central plot points to the movie. Well, I, I'm willing to give it a pass just on the fact that it's a wacky comedy. I think one of the sure. reasons why they went so crazy in the Mattel scene is because they ha had established a tone that this is just a wacky comedy movie. And they were going for that you know, kind of your highness type vibe. Yeah, but, so that's why I, yeah. I think it's a little, what, what you're doing kind of separating the real world, wanting like a, a more realistic vibe in the real world. I think it's just the tone of the movie isn't well, that kind of tone. Here's, here's the thing. I didn't do that. They did that. Okay. That's like, they're trying to create this, the movie very clearly is trying to create Barbie land is like wacky and goofy and then the real world is dark I don't and cynical so. and, and the patriarchy. Look, I think they could have done it. They that's what they have, did. I'm just that's what they did in the movie. Well, no, I I we disagree on the scenes at the beach and the cops and all that. I think all of those scenes are establishing a kind of wacky tone to say, okay, we're not going to go super serious in the real world either. Well, but the problem is that it's not like all of, except for the, if we remove the Mattel part, all the non serious parts of the real world are just people being sexist. That's it. Yeah, but they're being sexist in like over the top ways. Yeah, but that's it. But if, if, if I'm watching a movie and it's supposed to, and like everything is realistic except for the sexism, that doesn't to me signal that they're aware, like, oh, it's supposed to be like silly. No, I'm like, oh no, they just, it's, they, they think that people are just this sexist. You didn't think the car chase was, uh, was wacky not that wacky okay what was so wacky about the car chase just seemed wacky okay i don't know 
I don't know. I'm just saying, to me, they were trying to do this clear delineation between the Barbie land and the real world. And I think that's I think they have to make the delineation because the part of the point of the movie was like the real world was encroaching into the Barbie world, right? The mom's thoughts of death. You know, there was like a constant theme of like the real world has death and change and all these dark things in it. And the Barbie land has none of these things. And these things are encroaching into the Barbie land. So they're definitely creating this dual realm. Okay. Now, well, you I could just, say. Look, I disagree, but we can. Okay. Move. Well, I should say, I'll say one thing. You could say, this would be the argument that I think you could make to me. It would be like, well, since M- Mattel is supposed to be like the bridge between Barbie and the real world, and that's why it's wacky, because it's like supposed to be like one foot in Barbie land and one foot in the real world, maybe. But yeah. I don't, I don't think, think they works. really set it up that way, but. Though there is a funny thing that now, there is, I have a lot of questions about this movie about how much of the movie is structured the way it is because Mattel demanded it be structured the way it is. And there's a funny line in the movie where once Ken takes over Barbie land, Mattel is worried because once Ken takes over Barbie land, apparently the way the rules work is that whatever is happening in Barbie land, like makes toys in the real world. Right. Okay. And so when Ken takes over Barbie land, he's making everything miso- uh, misogynistic and, and patriarchy. It makes the Ken patriarchy toys manifest in the real world, just automatically. Well, and it's unclear because it, it seems as though it makes a demand for them, and they manufacture them to meet that demand. I took it. I took it that the the toys began to materialize, and then people liked those toys because there's a line where it's like, "Oh my God, all the people love the new Ken patriarchy toys. These things are selling like hotcakes." Right. Exactly. Right. And so, to but you me, can I interpret that either way. You could. I interpret it as this is yet another thing of saying how sexist our society is. Because, of course, since our society is so sexist, the sexist toys sell very well. Right. Um, but then here's where Mattel puts their finger on the script because Will Ferrell's character says, So someone asked Will Ferrell, they say, We're making so much money. Why do we care? And Will Ferrell says, you think I'm just doing this for the money? No! As CEO of Mattel, I'm doing this so that little girls can dream. Yeah, but it, that's so sarcastic. But he, no, he was being 100% serious because if it was just about the money, he would have just, they would have stopped. They wouldn't have tried to change anything back. Right. Hmm. So okay. he was being serious. And that but was, one to of me, the, that was Mattel putting their finger on the script saying, no, no, no. One of the things that I do think is super interesting about this movie is that it's kind of a Rorschach inkblot test because you can see this movie as making fun of wokeness very easily, or you can see this movie as super woke very easily. Mm -hmm. So really, and I do think this is, this is kind of the way you have to write movies in this atmosphere. (laughs) So, so people can, so you can basically play both of those markets at the same time. Mm Mm-hmm. And I don't, Sitch, obviously, we talked a little bit before this, and Sitch seems to think that that was accidental. And if it was, you know, I that's fine. I don't, okay. I don't really right. know. But Well, do, do you want to talk about the movie structure, or are we going to move on to the politics of it? Well, okay. Uh, which, I mean, do you, it seems like you agree with the movie structure having all these problems. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I laid out the problems. Right. I feel like I said everything I, I need gotcha. to say about the problems. So we, dis- we disagree on the tone. Bits. You know, there were some funny bits, but a lot of the funny bits were not funny either. So, well, so what was what were the funniest bits for you? I mean, obviously thought, the dance scene at the end was just fucking hilarious. But I, I liked I liked almost most of the jokes with Ryan Gosling were funny. Ryan um, Gosling was completely stole the show. It's pretty funny yeah. that people are already talking about him being nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. That won't and happen, a lot but. of people are complaining because obviously it's supposed to be a raw, raw feminist movie and yes. the male like <laughs> It's the best part of the movie. The male, yeah. Because right. he has a clear goal. He has a clear established goal. A clear from the goal very and beginning a clear of conflict. The, from the very beginning like in the very the first time we meet Ryan Gosling, yeah, he's he super wants to get the attention of Barbie, like that's his ultimate focus. And all the way through the movie, he he pursues that goal in every scene. So that makes him that makes him a likable character, someone who wants something and goes for it is who we like. The kinds of characters that we don't like are people who don't want to accomplish, you know, therapy Jeff. 
who don't want to accomplish anything and don't want to do anything <laughs> in the world. Those right. cold fishes are bad characters. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the politics of the situation. Okay. Tell me why you think the movie is intentionally made to be interpreted in either direction. Well, I, I don't, I'm sympathetic to your, to your analysis that it, it's accidental that they didn't know what they were doing, that they made a movie intentionally trying to be a feminist mantra and, and inadvertently placed all of these themes that are very conservative in nature. The fact that, they, you know, they're using traditional beauty standards. They, the guys literally establish a patriarchy for the women, <laughs> like all of these uh, various things that the feminist agenda would probably object to are inadvertently in the movie. And they, they're not, you know, they're so out of it that they're not really even aware that they're doing it. I think, uh, I think that could be the case. So I don't, you, mm -hmm. you said that you had some external information, like you did some research on the writers or something. Well, so no, maybe so, you have a more clear picture of this. Well, okay. To me, you definitely can't. And as I tweeted, I said, this movie is like the best unintentional accidental, like takedown of modern feminism. Right. And I responded, is it accidental? I do know like a lot of right. people are really sick of this woke shit. Right. No, I think hundred percent. Cause here, here's a perfect example of why I think it's accidental. So when they were filming the scene of Barbie and, and Ken on the Venice Beach, which they actually filmed on Venice Beach. Right. I remember. Um, they talked about how, in an interview, the director talked about how all these people, all these men, would come up to Ryan Gosling in that outfit. And they'd, talk, they'd high five him and say, oh, he looks great, and talk about how awesome he is. Right? Right. And no one would come up to Margot Ravi. Yeah, because... To her. Because wait, 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 before you say because, uh, don't, don't even say because. Don't give it away. Okay. okay go don't ahead. give it away. Okay. I know why. You know why. Yeah, okay. I know why. But here's why this is interesting. No one would come up to Margot Robbie's character and, and talk to her or tell her that she looks good or anything to that nature. They just look at her. They wouldn't come and talk to her. And this made her feel really uncomfortable that people were just looking at her and not saying anything to her. And the thing that's fascinating is that the director and Margot Robbie seem to interpret this as evidence of sexism. They oh, interpreted this sad. as like, see, all these men are coming up to the man, and they're talking about how good and awesome they are, and no one is coming up to Margot Robbie to tell her how good and awesome and beautiful she is. Right. right. That's how the director interpreted that interaction. Well, so that's what definitely is that? a point in your favor. Right. So, so, yes. So that tells you that the mindset of the world that they think they live in, because as, you, as, as I'll ask you, why do you really think it is that no one went up to Margot Robbie and talked to her when she was wearing that outfit? Well, they didn't want to be accused of sexism, obviously. The direct, ah. op the direct opposite of what they believe. Exactly. They didn't want to. They they didn't want to uh, say. Oh, they didn't want to get me tooed. Yeah, they didn't want to yes. get me tooed. They didn't want to get accused of 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 you know using the male gaze. So they couldn't say, "Oh, I like the way that you look." What you can't walk up to a girl in this day and age and say, "Oh, you have a pretty smile." What's your fucking? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. This it's, is what's so this. It's directly that's why the, opposite. Yeah. Yes, that's why when I was reading this article about this, my mind like blew up because so Margaret so Margaret Robbie's wearing this outfit which looks like it's straight out of the '80s. She's wearing like this like unitard thong. She looks she's got, great. Like, I mean, looks great. Yeah, she's wearing this like neon unitard thong, but she's wearing super tight like uh, yeah. short shorts underneath the thong. Right. Right. So, but it's definitely like a very like sexually outfit. Yes. In 2023. No guy is going to feel comfortable enough walking over to superstar Margot Robbie wearing this very sexual outfit and like complimenting the outfit because they think they're going to get accused of sexism yep. or meet or me too or something horrible. But then on the flip side, women aren't going to go over and compliment the outfit because they're going to look at this outfit as this is not an outfit that's empowering to women. This is a highly sexual outfit. This outfit is perfectly uh, exemplifying the male gaze of objective another, women. Another point of evidence that feminism has won. <laughs> yes, yes. And so, and so the only people 
when they have this interaction of of Barb of Ryan Gosling and Margot Robbie wearing these outfits sitting next to each other, so because of this weird fem because literally because of feminism in 2023, no one feels comfortable going up to Margot Robbie because they don't know what to say to her. But yeah. everyone feels totally comfortable going up to the man because you can objectify the man as much as you fucking want. No one you, cares. You can say can anything. Go yes. You go up to Ryan Gosling like, oh man, you look shredded. You look great. You look so awesome. Oh, it's a great outfit. Like you can say whatever you want to Ryan Gosling. Yeah. And it's totally fine because you won't get accused of anything bad. But everyone's too terrified to come up and talk to Marco Rabe. Right. And to me, and then the director doesn't understand that that's why this is happening. She thinks that this has something to do with her message for feminism because she's so detached from what the actual's going on in the situation, the social situation. That is a great, great point. Yeah. Thank you. So, so it, you, it is accidental then. Well, there's, there's one point in the movie that I think is hilarious. When, mm -hmm. when Ryan Gosling goes to the, the jobs and he's like, I'm a man, right? Just give me a job. So he's read all this feminist study, patriarchy bullshit. Right. And he thinks I can just get a job because I'm a man. Right. But then discovers that the real world is still a meritocracy. And then his immediate response is, well, I'm go back to the imaginary world where I can just <laughs> make it happen. Yes. How is that not? I mean, that is just too perfect yes. in making fun of wokeness. That it, well, the, it, yeah. How is that accidentally in the movie? Well, I don't know. This is why I say that when I when I tweet about this, I said the movie is incredibly confused thematically about what it's trying to say, because that one scene, it's like one scene where that one guy is very telling because he, the guy yeah, but Ken goes up to him. He says he, both, which makes yes. me think they are aware or someone on the writing staff is aware. I don't know what it means because he because the guy, he says, give me a job. The guy says, no, he says, but I thought we live in a, I thought being a man helps. The guy says, actually, right now it's the opposite. Right. So he right. knows feminism is a thing and that right. they're more likely to hire him for being a woman. He says yes. so. But then he's like, I thought we live in a patriarchy. And he said, well, we still do, but we hide it better, which then contradicts what he just said. Correct. Yes. So but it is somewhat like, self-aware. I guess. Is it self-aware or is it just that that character is supposed to be a sexist? So from his perspective, he's like, oh, you know, he's like the jaded male who's like, actually, you know, because of affirmative action, it's actually better. Oh, yeah, right that now. could be. That could be. Yeah. That could be why it's accidentally in there and hilarious. Yeah, I guess. But so the, the thing that's kind of fascinating to me, part, part of why this is what I realized uh, before we were streaming. This movie is the perfect accident of of a mother of a 40 or 50 year old woman imparting her anxieties and fears onto her daughter as a receptacle right that's what this movie is literally and metaphorically is metaphorically it's a 40 to 50 year old woman taking her fears and anxiety and pushing them into barbie that's literally what is the inciting incident of the movie right yep that's and, that's a universe that they establish that's the universe but the thing is that that's the perfect metaphor for woke feminism it is <laughs> and the movie perfectly shows this because when when i first saw this movie i thought if they really wanted to do the scenes where barbie comes to the real world and everyone's super sexist it should have just been taking place in like 1960 right oh yeah because then those scenes might have made sense right the guy slaps her in the ass the police officers are super sexist towards her you know all, all this other stuff in the 1960s you could say okay i could see that happening or at least i could see it happening more than in 2023 of all places and but once i realized that framing i said wait a minute the reason that it takes place in 2023 and the person sees and thinks this is the real world with this amount of sexism exists is because they're taking it's like a 50 year old woman taking her experiences with sexism from the 1960s and imparting it to her children now and thinking the world still operates this way yeah and that's what she's doing to barbie She's shoving in her fears and anxieties about sexism into Barbie, even though from Barbie's perspective, she's never experienced any of this yeah. in the Barbie land. And the same thing from her daughter. Her daughter's sitting there giving her these, you know, woke speeches about patriarchy and capitalism and fascism. The daughter's a privileged brat who's never experienced any of this in her entire life. Yeah. What and yet she go ahead. And yet she feels 
like she gets like she has the ability to speak about all this stuff and to me this movie is the perfect example of what's wrong with woke feminism it's the smothering mother the smothering 50 year old mother taking her experiences of sexism from 50 years ago and shoving them into her daughter and saying this is the world you still live in and then a bunch of kids thinking it's still the world they live in when it's not right and the conflict created by believing the world is like that when it actually isn't which yes. which my thing is that's like the the biggest missed opportunity in this movie is the daughter character because i, I would like rather than setting it in 1960 where the sexism could be overt i don't i mean that you, you would have to find a way to deal with your criticism for me it's enough that 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 it deals with it in just this is the wacky world that we live. This is the wacky tone of the movie, so therefore they can make all of these sexist jokes, and we just kind of go with it. That's enough for me. I understand that you're having problems with that, but the mm -hmm. the missed opportunity for me is that super super woke character having some sort of realization that wokeness is just is wrong. Well, and yeah. that they've been fed this line from their mom that just is a world that doesn't exist anymore. Yes, and coming to that realization could be completely meaningful as a B story that just never the, the relationship between none of this was expressed openly in the relationship between the mom and the daughter. And no. it's just such a, a, just a giant, you know, missed opportunity, as I said before. So it, it's weird. I don't know if you ever saw it. There's a cartoon called gumball. Um, yeah, I've seen a, some gumball. Yeah. Have you seen, there's like a very famous clip a few years ago where gumball is using social justice. He literally says, I am a social justice warrior. He's using wokeness to defeat people and to exert power over them. <laughs> That's hilarious. Like very overt, like completely overt. It's all very overt. And there's a scene where he's like, use, like whenever someone like transgresses him in any way, he's like, have you thought about taking your privilege? <laughs> like he's using <laughs> like all the language to like make people do what he wants them to do. It's, it's so brilliant. Well, they and set up that character that way where they had the character even come out and say, no, you don't want to talk to her, but then yes! they just kind of dropped it. Yes. So it was so weird because so wild because there's like literally that scene that happened in Gumball where in Gumball, it's like very clear that Gumball is wrong and he ends up like getting punished for it where he's using wokeness as a weapon. The daughter character in the movie does the exact same thing, uses wokeness as a weapon, and it's never she's never punished for it. She's never called out for it. And even at the end of the movie, her last line in the movie is her telling her father to stop culturally appropriating Spanish. Right. So she never comes to any sort of realization on wokeness, which is yes. a giant. It's just such a missed opportunity. It yes. hurts so bad. But see, to me, that's, again, like another very clear indication that, that any sort of critique of feminism here was an accident. See that the scene where the where we first meet the daughter and the daughter is obviously using social justice and completely just eviscerates Barbie, calls her a fascist. That scene for me was hilarious because it's just so accurate. But it's yeah. it is painful if they think if that's like the drama movie for the, the drama scene for the feminist who wrote this movie, like she's thinking, oh, this will be very serious. People will take this scene serious, and I'm taking it like comedy. That's a complete miscommunication of right? the movie. Yeah, it it would have been funny if it was clear that she was in the wrong, uh, for doing this. Yeah, but we don't know that. by the end of the movie. Yeah, right. Okay, but here's another here's another way in which the themes of the movie made absolutely no sense. The opening scene of the movie is an homage to 2001, which first of all, it's, it's very interesting. People were saying, why are, like Ben Shapiro in his review was like, why are all these reviews, why are all these references in this movie that like children won't get? This movie is not for children. It's for adults, obviously. Yeah, it's PG-13, what the fuck? This movie is not for children. This movie is for 40 and 50-year-old mothers to go to to take their daughter to, their daughter not understand half the movie, and then after the movie, the mom's going to hug their daughter and cry and right. think that she had some emotional, powerful moment in this movie. That's the point of the movie. This movie we, was made for 40 or 50-year-old women. We went to an 11 p.m. show last night, mm -hmm. and between the previews, you could hear all of the moms and daughters talking in the theater. <laughs> so you are 
one hundred percent correct. When we left the movie, all I saw was moms and daughters, and I was thinking, like tearfully hugging each other. Oh my! That's God. exactly what was happening. So many yep. moms took all of their daughters to yep. see this movie together. Yep, and I and I don't even. And it, it's, but it's made for the mothers primarily. It's not made for the daughters, which is again goes into the theme I said of this movie is about mothers shoving their insecurities onto their children in kind of a very gross way that I think is completely inappropriate. So the beginning of the movie is the, is a bunch of girls playing with dolls that are baby dolls. And it's like the narrator is like, you know, in the beginning, girls could only pretend to be mothers. But then Barbie came along and they could be anything they want to be. And you see like the girls destro literally destroying the baby dolls like the monkeys in 2001. The 2001 um, homage is very good. I like that. Well, this is supposed to now, this is a little confused. This is supposed to be homage because I think in, in reality, like before Barbie became popular, I think the only dolls that existed were paper dolls and like maybe cloth dolls. They didn't have these like plastic dolls at all. And that's kind of why Barbie took off. But anyway, this theme is important. So the beginning of the movie establishes all girls could do was play at mothering. Yeah, pretend and, to be moms. And now, because Barbie exists, they can do anything they want to do. Right. Okay? They can be that's career the, woman. Yeah, they can be a career woman. That's the opening scene of the movie. Okay, that's setting the stage. Right. Here's the problem. Everything in the movie, every single thing in the movie that has to do with a female character discovering some important emotional part about herself, it's all about them being a mother. Yes. That's it. The entire conflict that the mother has with the daughter is because she's a mother and a daughter. We don't, it has nothing to do with her career or anything, nothing to do with her husband. It's literally all about her relationship with her daughter is a problem. Yep. When Barbie becomes a human, and she gets imparted the magic to become human by the creator of Barbies in the in the the bright dimension. The what what happens is when she touches her, she gets all these memories of a mother daughter, you know, playing together and mother daughter experience. Yeah. And then at the end of the movie, when she's finally human, was what does she do? She goes to the gynecologist to get which her the JJ checked out. Right? Which implies she's gonna be a mother. <laughs> Right, or that some yeah, that being a mother, being a woman has to do with your vagina, which is about having your ability to procreate and have children. Yeah. Okay, so this is why I'm saying the, the the people that made this movie are stupid. The beginning of the movie is you don't need to be a mother to be a woman or to be a girl, but then every other part of the movie is the opposite. Yeah, that's all. That's all the conflict for the women characters derives from their motherhood. Yes. Yep. What's happening? <laughs> muddled writing yes it doesn't make any sense it's the, the complete mess i'm like what's happening here muddled writing yeah so do, do you want to give some final thoughts and then we'll wrap it up um why well, I, I just have so much to say about this let me look at my okay look i don't want to look if you have more to say definitely say it there there was an interesting thing if i hear this here my notes there's an interesting thing i noticed that that scene where the mother character is going on the rant about all the problems being women, like I had like a million ideas like came to my head. That scene was so like powerful by accident, <laughs> because I realized some very key important thing about modern feminism and modern self help psychology. And so, in the old days or in the older days of things, we had our fictional characters be aspirational characters, right? Right. Something we want to achieve. Right. And so since our characters are aspirational, they would be very attractive. They'd be very handsome or beautiful. They'd be very buff or fit. They'd be hyper competent Mor in some realm. Morally superior. Morally superior, righteous. Or they would start off in a lesser place, and then by the end of the movie, they would become greater, right? Yes, totally. The whole, the whole point of these characters were to be aspirational as like a goal to attain. Even if you can never really truly attain it, it's just always out there for you to keep reaching for, right? Yeah, of course. Um, but here's the problem. With sort of modern feminism and the modern self-help movement, everyone hates the idea of aspirations. It's all about accepting who you are as you are. Yes, yeah. Currently. Like, this is what we saw with Therapy Jeff. You should just, nothing matters. 
be nihilistic and accept who you are in this moment. And to me, this is when the light bulb went off with Barbie. Because if you have an aspirational attitude, you can look at Barbie and say, okay, maybe I'll never... Because the number one concern that was levied at Barbie in the 60s and by feminists was that Barbie had an unrealistic proportions, right? Unrealistic body, beauty standard that no little girl could ever match and thus she'll feel bad about herself because she could never match this unrealistic standard of beauty, right? Yeah, supposedly. But the thing that's weird is that that was never applied to men. Like for all of history, men's, you know, male heroes have been super buff, super good looking, super competent people generally, obviously exceptions, but generally. And yet we never had this like, well, men are not, you know, men are feeling bad because they can't aspire to be these heroes, right? And I think it's because there was this shift that occurred that was from no longer viewing these characters as aspirational. Because if you view Barbie as aspirational, it doesn't matter if she has an unrealistic standard of beauty. It's just an aspirational thing. It's not like, it's not real. It's something to aspire to. But if you switch it from you shouldn't really aspire to anything, you should just be completely happy with who you are as you are, suddenly Barbie's a massive slap in the face because it's like, it reminds you, instead of it being something to aspire to, it reminds you what you aren't. Right. And, and I think that's one of the key psychological problems with modern feminism and with the modern self-help movement and with the modern acceptance movement. Because yeah, obviously you want to have some level of, self, it's, not like a, it's not like a zero-sum game. You want to have some level of self-acceptance, you know, was it was the AA thing? You know, uh, God allow me to accept the things I can't change and change the things I can. Right. Right. You need to have this balance in your life, and it seems like in the past you could say maybe the balance was too far in the direction of no accepting yourself, just aspire, aspire, aspire. But now we've gone way too much in the other direction, where it's it just accept yourself. You don't need to actually change. You're perfect the way you are, which is which is BS. Which is total. Which is total hooey. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's the modern self-esteem movement right there. Yeah, and that's what leads and in that scene where the mom's going off on all the proms. It's it to me that's what leads the lack of, of viewing Barbie as aspirational is what leads to this jealousy and anger that you know women and feminists would have towards the Barbie character. Right. The daughter basically says this in the scene that yes. she's creating unrealistic beauty standards that she'll never be able to live up to. Right. That's literally like a, a yeah. line from the movie. Yeah. So, but they never d dive deeply into any of these psychological aspects, which is just so sad because they have such fertile ground to really, I mean, this could have been as good as the matrix if they really wanted to dive into these ideas. Yes. The setup for this movie is great. Yeah. I love the sub this movie. And then as soon as she goes to the real world, it just all falls to it pieces. It does, yeah. Because, th like, there's two ways you could do this. There's the smart, well, there's the way I expected it to be, which is like, this would be like the movie Enchanted, where it's just not political. You know, you have a Disney princess character who enters the real world. She brings magic to the real world while also learning some important things from the real world that she can bring back to her Disney princess land, right? Yes, yeah. I thought that was going to be Barbie's going to go to the real world. It's going to be just fish out of water comedy. And she's going to bring whimsy to some people in the real world. And then when she goes back, she'll bring some useful information about the real world back to the, the Barbie world or something. Um, but no, it, instead they did this super heavy handed, super woke, slapping you on the face with all this political gobbledygook. And they did it in the most like dumb, convoluted, simplistic muddled confused way possible they want to sell toys to social justice warriors well see that's what i wonder i wonder how much of the muddledness of the themes is because maybe the director and mattel have competing interests they do as to what exactly they want they do obviously somewhat aligned because i do think the mattel mattel has to cater to social justice in the same way that every other corporation is forced to do that so mm -hmm. yeah the idea i mean the idea that mattel has a board that is 100 percent men <laughs> is like that seems laughable to me that can't be it's the not case. It's, it's it's the so mattel has a board of 11 people five are women and six are men yes that seems much more re, uh, realistic 
Yeah. And the and the woman who created Barbie ran the company for like 30, 40 years or something. Right. So the whole like this is all his jokes about like when Barbie goes to see Mattel and all the people that run it are men. Like that does that's just that's just fake. That's just literally a lie. Totally. Yeah. Yes. And I'm kind of surprised Mattel allowed that to occur in the because it makes them look kind of bad. So anything else? Go to your notes. Let's finish up. Uh that was it. That's I, it? Okay. Yeah, do you, do you want to argue with anyone about this movie? Well, I, I do, but I want to wrap up our review here we can wrap so up we can review. clip it out. And then I think um, all in all, I found the movie entertaining. I think uh, it was a lot more entertaining for me than Sitch because I had running commentary in the theater for my wife who has played with Barbies <laughs> and experienced every Barbie product there could possibly be. Really? So she was filling me in on a lot of the jokes right? with a lot of the different things. You know, oh, I wanted that. Oh, I could never get that. <laughs> like, <laughs> when they did, they do one thing that is super interesting where uh, Ken throws Barbie's clothes out and the clothes are basically put into a product shot as they fly through the air. Because they freeze are, in the air <laughs> and it says the name of the outfit. Yeah. Which are obviously product shots to sell the toys, which yes, I thought, yeah. okay, this is that that's funny, beautiful. Yeah. yeah, that was funny. Yeah. Which, I mean, if they would have stayed with the girl being more consistent, if they would have made the daughter more like the the Spider Verse Spider, the Punk Spider Man character, she would have obviously rolled her eyes at all of those capitalists clothes freezing in the <laughs> air right going right, oh right. my god they're trying to yes. sell everything in this movie right. which could have been a lot more fun a lot more interesting so yeah. i just my my big thing was i did think stylistically i thought a lot of the jokes worked i thought ryan gosling's performance was just out of this world i mean i might even recommend the movie just for ryan gosling's performance obviously i saw it because everyone's talking about it and 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 trying to spin the movie in one way or another so i obviously felt like i had to see it myself but um but just you know a big giant missed opportunity probably for a lot of the reasons that sitch is saying that they just it was written by a couple of woke feminists who just really aren't able to understand the the cultural atmosphere that we're in right now clearly enough to make some of these jokes and they're just incidentally in the movie out of accident. So yeah. Um, so I found the movie for the most part incredibly boring. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's way too long. The movie's like two hours for no reason. Um, uh, I, I mean, I found it interesting because I was going to review it, and I found I found all these like inconsistencies about what I thought the movie wanted to say and what it was actually saying. To me, it was interesting while I'm watching the movie. Um, I don't know. I don't think most people would have that experience when they're watching the movie. I think most people will find it boring. I think if you're a young man and you, you know, I think if you're a youngish man and mm -hmm. you're kind of like don't know where your place in society is, you would actually be incredibly insulted by this movie because the movie basically spits in your face. If you have any sort of, um, you know, if you're male and you don't really know where you belong in society and it makes fun of you essentially for not knowing where you are in society um they did have funny jokes i wish i wish that all the political stuff wasn't there or wasn't so overt because yeah it could have been a decent movie but i would not recommend watching it <laughs> um though i do think that, you know ryan gosling was very good as ken and as i said in, in twitter and this is the irony of the thing in a, in a few years no one will remember any of the barbies any of the barbie characters all the barbie characters in this movie are so utterly forgettable and boring and no one will care about them and all anyone will remember from this movie is ryan gosling as ken that's all yes. that will survive yeah. from this movie and the memes of him playing as ken is all that will survive from this movie in the coming years yeah so he is he is hilarious he completely hits it out of the park yes i don't think i, I didn't really get any big laughs from from the barbie character at all I got tons of mm. fun laughs from Ken and the daughter when she was the angsty daughter. But as right. soon as she became, you know, as soon as her character completely contradicted itself, it was like stupid. So, right. But anyway, so we'll go ahead. We'll wrap this up. I'll, uh, 
You, uh, CT, you can go ahead and clip it here. Hi, you just listened to a clip from the Sitch and Adams show. If you like what you heard, you can listen to our live show right here on this channel on Sunday, starting at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And if you want, you can super chat us. We read $20 and up super chats on the show and then do a follow-up stream on the following Tuesday where we read the rest of the unread super chats and interact with fans of the show. Subscribe to this channel right here to listen to the live show or to listen to more of our awesome clips.